Hey everybody, Joe here from the Lines Led by Donkeys podcast, but uh, I guess you probably already knew that. If you like what we do here on the show, consider supporting us on Patreon at www.patreon.com slash Lions Led by Donkeys. Just $5 per month gets you every regular episode early, access to our community Discord, a digital copy of my book, The Hooligans of Kandahar, as well as its audiobook, read by me, and over five years of bonus content. By supporting the show, you support us and allow us to keep our show as it has always been ad-free. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. Hey, everybody. This is uh, Joe from the future here. I actually have a correction to issue here when I'm talking about Indigenous and Australian citizenship and uh, enlistment. So Indigenous Australians were given Australian citizenship at the same time as other Australians in 1949. However, the quality of that citizenship was not equal to that of non-Indigenous Australians, and this continued for decades. And as many Indigenous Australian activists have pointed out, that pretty much kind of continues to this day. This discrimination extended to enlistment. It was technically legal for Indigenous people to enlist, but in practical application, that was not always the case. Some were turned away based on simple skin color, for example, saying that they were too dark. Other people were allowed to enlist and serve in segregated units, such as you know, the Tory Strait Islanders. Other people were simply turned away just because of baseline they didn't want indigenous people in the military and this varied wildly between branches after enlistment they were not given benefits or awards for the most part they were treated incredibly unequally people were not given the same amount of pay in some instances they were not paid at all thought i wanted to clear some of that up now back to the show hey everybody welcome to the lions led by donkeys podcast i'm joe and with me trapped in the british based content basement of the trash future studios is nate what's up buddy hey what's up yeah i mean in a way it's it's fun to be actually making content because i feel as though i have been spending a significant amount of time in the trash future content basement the 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 the, the london dungeon if you will uh trying to do system upgrades and they haven't fucking worked and so uh like just being like oh i'm doing something involving recording on microphones as opposed to like figuring out where the line buzz is coming from and shit it's actually really nice to be to be in the cell so in a way it's like it's like you know locked in a dungeon brackets positive you know it's it's interesting because i'm looking as you know of course um i'm looking for a studio space um to build the Lions Led by Donkey Studio here in the Netherlands, because I have learned there are certain quirks uh, in Dutch law, uh, both in business and uh, like renters law that you can't really work from home um, necessarily. Um, for instance, like handling merchandise and things like that. Like I, I can't do that from my house. If my landlord finds out, I will be in trouble and the municipality cannot help me. So I'm looking for in case you're listening landlord i don't currently do that um but i'm looking for a studio space (laughs) and it's very very funny because i'm trying to find a place in the city i live in the hague and there is a lot of office space but obviously not everything works as a studio um and i'm looking around and so the landlord or the the real estate agents and the landlord's like so what is it that you do i'm like oh well you know i we have a audio production company and like, okay, but what kind of... And it doesn't work with Dutch people. You can't just be like, this is something I do vaguely. They're like, okay, no, but what do you actually do? We, and they just cut to the chase. They're like, you know, it's, you know we, we do audio production. We record um, audio as well. So we'll have like a recording booth in there, but like not like music. And they're like, <laughs> one real estate is like, are you telling me you're a podcaster? <laughs> I was just like, Yeah. <laughs> I, I I always say I just we just do we, yeah yeah digital media production we record podcasts voiceovers audiobooks uh, the other night I had an Uber driver who was really into audiobooks uh, and telling me about erotic audiobooks in Bangladesh and I was just like I'm glad that folks are fucking using digital recording media to to, to really get after the thing that matters which is listening to someone narrate an erotic story I've done hey, it we've once done it. I never <laughs> want to do it again yeah exactly hey, that's not true we've done it twice. We have done it. That is correct. Twice. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's funny. Uh, I don't know if I told you this story, but I actually got refused service from an online bank because they don't do business with podcasters. It happened to me as well. 
here. Yeah. yeah. And they, they, they argued that it was because they didn't want to potentially be responsible for any content and thereby being like associated with it if it was something that violated like or just made them look bad, which I understand. But it was funny because they were so vague about why they denied it to me. And, you know, because I'm an American and I had to show my American passport in like a video and record or rather I showed my British passport, but I was taught how to narrate a thing for this like ID verification thing. And so I was like, oh, fuck, did they hear my American accent? I mean, that's a stupid thought because it's almost always going to be like either uh, uh, like analyzed by a computer or it's going to be outsourced to someone in like a call center somewhere in the developing world. But then my my accountant, who was the person who had like the business like customer relations liaison for this company, asked them and then they were like, oh, it's not because he's American. It's because he's a podcaster. <laughs> that happened. To, that happened to me as well. But I think it had more to do with like the way we monetize the show like we don't have ads and so i was taught like my my initial application was denied so like i contacted the bank like you know what the fuck and i thought it was maybe because i'm american i don't have dutch nationality i didn't have a residency card at the time which i now have um and they're like well no it's because like in your in the paperwork he's like your show runs off of donations i was like yes like but it's not a charity like no it's a registered company in the netherlands like but that, that's not a sustainable business model. I'm like, yeah, you're telling me. <laughs> it's, it's subscriber. They pay for subscription. Like, I don't that, know. That's like, kind of how I th- tried to frame it is like, we have a subscription yeah. service. Like, yeah, but like, you know, it's uh, all your money comes from Patreon. And like, you know, we're just not going to, we're not going to set up a business account for that. Yeah, we had, we had a similar problem with, with British banks, uh, basically not understanding the business model at all. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've been, it's very funny. And like, yes, I am the first to admit that you are building a foundation on fucking quicksand in in the sense that you are fully reliant on one payment processor. And like, if that platform owned by a venture capital firm, a private, private equity firm that's run by Jared Kushner's brother decides to do something stupid and fucking nosedives, like, it's not like the fan base goes away, but obviously you have to rebuild it. And also payment processing is one of those things that's annoying no matter what you, and you can't really DIY it. No. You know what no. I mean? Uh, nor would you want to, because like, it would be like world's most declined transaction. And so, yeah, I'm aware of that, but it is very funny sometimes if you're sort of like, Right, but you all give a business account to like world's most obvious shell companies. So right, it's just like and, you tell me which one is the biggest problem. And, and you know, my money is real. It's coming in. It might not be in tomorrow, but it is in for now. You know, I will. I will give them credit. They also wouldn't work with crypto companies, which like I mean, we're yeah, not one. Five, but like, <laughs> uh, you know, at the back of my head, I was thinking, you know, it, it, if I just showed up at the port in Rotterdam with like a VOC sailboat full of uh, mysterious gold from Indonesia. Y'all wouldn't ask any questions, but because it comes from Patreon, I can't get an account. It's the JJ Kasabian Batavia Trading Company. (laughs) Do not ask what's in the shipping container. Exactly. Um, Nate, I've gathered you here, us here. Uh, That sentence doesn't work. I've gathered us here today to to talk about a very dumb piece of, of, of World War II history. It has nothing to do with any real battles. Because we just came off of five weeks of talking about the Boxer Rebellion. So I figure we'd have to reset somewhat and talk about something truly stupid. And what is dumber in the history of military conflict than soldiers? Oh, yeah. I mean, to me, that's what makes it always interesting is that you think, oh, it must have been so different. And then you actually, because I've talked to guys who were World War II or Korean War vets, and they're like, no, it's literally the exact same. They were drawing dicks in like fucking, in the, 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 the port of shitters of 1945 and 1950 that were like made out of wood, outhouses, slit trenches. You give a guy a slit trench, he's going to take out his fucking 1940s equivalent of a Gerber and carve a dick into the tree for some reason. Exact well, it's same. It's like they found dicks drawn on the walls and like old... Uh, Roman outposts and stuff, oh, and, and like graffiti, like basically like like calling a guy gay, but not in the pejorative sense of like how we grew up in the Midwest, but rather being like this guy sucks at being gay, and that's why we're making fun of it. <laughs> like that's a different kind. Of, that's a very impressive level of like true Roman or Greek discrimination. It's like yeah, you're gay, but you're not even good at it. You're not even good at it. You're bad at being gay. And <laughs> <laughs> do this long enough, we're gonna call the gay cops. Mid. That's a, a callback to, to a whole different whole different story. Suetonius. <laughs> mid yeah exactly like like (laughs) yeah like the antonines give better head than this (laughs) now during world war ii soldiers of allied nations were stationed throughout the world for a lot of reasons 
ease of deployment to you know upcoming combat areas, rest and relaxation, simple garrisoning duty, and of course, defending an area from a possible attack. And as anybody who's ever lived near soldiers can tell you, that is not always a pleasant experience for anyone involved. The soldiers don't want to be there. Generally speaking, you don't want the soldiers there. But you, the two worlds will mix at some point. There's the whole point in the U.S. Constitution about get keep the troops out of my house. I don't like yeah, it. Yeah, it's because nobody so, wants to live around soldiers. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because nobody wants to have like that disgusting, like, uh, let's be perfectly honest here, like seven layer dip of cum sock smell. And I fucking know that very well because I was on the last thing smoking for my brigade out of Afghanistan and I wound up having to do more or less over personally involved, not just overseeing a detail, literally doing it myself with some soldiers. All of the Joes abandoned their dirty old uniforms in the clamshell tent at Bagram and we had to get them all taken because it's it's legit this they is were probably so stiff they were standing in rank still yeah this is gonna sound stupid to people but this is this 2010 this is actually a valid concern you can't just take all of those uh fire retardant acus and just throw them in the trash because the trash is handled by people who if they were like hmm these are american uniforms we can take them and sell them who are they going to sell people who want them it might just be guy who r- drives a truck and wants to look cool in afghanistan that that guy exists. It might also be guy who's like, hmm, we can dress up as fucking, you know, Afghan auxiliary troops and sneak in somewhere. Which they did. So they have, <laughs> which they did all the time. So we had like hundreds of uniforms that hadn't been washed in months because it's Joe, not Joe Kasabian, but Joe, the the collective term for enlisted soldiers. And so they have one, to be incinerated. One and all. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's the thing. It's like you have to they have to be incinerated, uh, you know in an incinerator probably fueled by expensive imported diesel fuel taken on an overland route and it's like what is a better metaphor for the war in afghanistan than these uniforms are designed to be fire retardant and we need to burn them with b- diesel that we got by flying it in or trucking it in from pakistan yeah, unfortunately cum and ball sweat is not fla- a flammable <laughs> oh. miasma of, of, of oh, i just liquids. i just dip 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 bottles dirty underwear socks Frack use, just stuff. I so much fucking stuff. And yep, it's all like, yep, you've been in country 13 months, probably longer than anyone in the brigade. Guess what your job is, Captain or Lieutenant Bethay? Fucking cum socks. Just get get all you're of them. At the you're at the cum rag detail. Yeah, exactly. It's like you're gonna open a goodwill for the grossest pieces of cloth in human. You know what history. else they call the cum rag detail, Nate? Being airborne. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck does that have to do with anything? You guys well, fuck you like guys, that's why. You're six foot four and they put your ass in a fucking sardine can. Like, not even Fidel Castro did that shit to people. You volunteered for it. The army didn't do anything to me. I did that to myself because I alone am stupid. Like, yes, paratroop, being a paratrooper breaks your body like nobody's business. Like, fuck me, the, the opening shot, can, especially when you're jumping with a combat ruck, is awful. But you know what? I jumped like, I think, 18 times in seven years in the army. Like, you got your ass cramped into a tank more than 18 times in a month in the field. Look, if there's if there's one thing paratroopers and tank crewmen can agree on is that we neither of us pr- probably really need to exist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but at least tanks are still used in modern conflict. <laughs> yes, that's true. And also, like, if you're gonna use the the, the engine block of your mech- your vehicle, your your if you're gonna use the engine block of your mode of transportation to get warm when it's cold, you'd much rather stand in the fucking exhaust funnel from an Abrams tank than in the fucking <laughs> Drop watch of the fucking C-130 or C-17. It will warm you up, but it smells like like you're huffing more fumes than fucking the dude from Stone Temple Pilots. And oh, rest you're in on peace, a fl- buddy. <laughs> you're on, I, lo- I loved that band. Actually, you know what? It's really mean. I, I made that reference not even wanting to be a dickhead because Scott Weiland was actually a really good dude. It just sucked what happened to him. But more that my home radio station did a fucking free concert tickets giveaway you had to be like the seventh caller and your cue to call in was them playing a sound of as they described it so- scott wyland huffing fumes off his tour bus's tailpipe oh my god and it was just like sucking sounds on the radio so in a way i feel like a dickhead i've become the shock jocks doing a of, fat bong rip of c-130 fumes of, of in these new rock alternative x-103 i'm fucking i'm just as bad as them and and probably look just as frumpy as they did in <laughs> 1999. In a long enough timeline, we all become shock jocks. Yeah, in a long enough timeline, we all become fucking, was it Michael Malice or, or fucking the guys Mad on- Mad Cow on, in the morning, is he a shock yeah, jock? Drive, yeah, drive, yeah, yeah, drive, drive time commute, whatever the LA guys, you know, always getting fired for some kind of like racist song they wrote. 
Um, yeah, so <laughs> we've got a digression already. It's very early. I never miss a opportunity to fire a shot at paratroopers, much like anybody standing on the ground with a rifle. I was going to say, much like, much like the Allied air defenses in Sicily when it was Allied paratroopers coming in. I never miss a shot to fire at paratroopers, says literally anyone who has ever watched an airborne insertion. Yeah. Now, generally speaking, depending on where that soldier happened to be stationed, the local populace was perfectly happy to have them. And this had nothing to do with like allied brotherhood or anything. It was rather simple practicality. World War II was a shit time to be alive for more reasons than anybody could count. But on the home front, far away from the front lines, there was boredom, a lack of commerce for the local economy, and of course, rationing, which made getting normal everyday things incredibly hard or simply impossible, depending on what you were looking for. This rationing, of course, hit armies at war, as well as most armies were not exactly awash with creature comforts. Their soldiers got enough to get by, hopefully, and were given a small paycheck on top of it. Again, hopefully. Depending on what country you happen to be serving in, voluntarily or against your will, your experience may vary on that front. But one country that didn't really have this problem was the United States. In comparison to its peers, American soldiers were clothed well, paid better than anybody, and were issued with things like chocolate and silks that a normal person, civilian or otherwise, just couldn't get anymore. So when American soldiers showed up on the shores of an allied nation, they brought all of those things with them. Which led to, let's say, the most likely possible outcome. A barter system, a whole new economy about prostitution. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which, yeah. Both of those items, I'm like, hmm, it was a full, the full spectrum of human experience of what you can trade for sex, chocolate and silk. You know what? It reminds me of the, we, we watched Fury for a bonus episode years ago, and I, it's still uh-huh. one of my favorite movies when it comes to tanks, because I am a simple man. Uh, again, mm-hmm. I was a tank crewman, but um, you were. Th- there's a line is like, you know, she'll fuck you for a chocolate bar. He's like, no, she won't. And he's like, bet you would. <laughs> I mean, look, it's not, it's not good. It's not great. It's bad, actually. But it's true. It's real. It's not. It's real. It 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 does happen. Uh, doesn't didn't really. I'm not aware of it being a, a thing at, to any degree of the scale uh, that it was in the past in conflicts like post Vietnam, just because of both the military cracking down on shit and also just like where the wars were being fought. Hence the weird, the weird excuse that Jeremy Renner's character gives in um, the Hurt Locker when he sneaks back onto (laughs) Fob Liberty uh, through the main ECP and tells the gate guard who knocks him down and detains him that he was at a whorehouse. And it's like, I can't think of a, a, a more of definitionally the place you get killed at than you as an American soldier in Iraq being like, I'm going to walk off post and go to what I've ho- have been told is a whorehouse. Yeah, I, I'm sure things like that existed, but I've never heard of them. Yeah, it's called, the, but the people who got to do them were uh, your brigade commander taking TDY in Turkey with his interpreter uh, who call, calling it coin centric TDY. Yeah, or, uh, or the guy in your the, unit who took a suspicious amount of vacations to Thailand. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, troops are troops, soldiers are soldiers, goes throughout history. Uh, the U.S. military in the last 30 years is the only one who have decided to say that we can, uh, we can finally achieve humanity's noble goal of banning sex, and it were, has worked about as well as you would imagine. Ah, uh, yes. The, the infamous pornography ban. So everybody... Certainly follow General Order Number One. Yeah, gen- good old General Order Number One. Uh, can't fuck unless you're married and deployed together. Uh, can't have sex at all. And that led to a lot of marriages, I bet. I a mean, lot of quickie marriages. I mean, but it's but it's not. They did, they didn't even have the fucking dodge that Shia Islam has, where you can have like the temporary fifteen minute marriage, twenty if you last longer. Like it had to be legally married. You actually go to Jag and get married. Ah, man, who needs a twenty minute marriage? Get out of here with that shit. No. <laughs> Now I mean, it's got like you know, time to warm up and smoke a cigarette <laughs> while still being married because it, it might be illegal. You could do that while you're divorced. It might I be have. illegal to smoke a cigarette <laughs> in bed or outside your bee hut with someone in a in a state of post coital fucking relaxation if you're not married. The army loves defining shit like that. Now all of this brings us to American soldiers in Australia during World War II and what would become known as the Battle of Brisbane. I know. 
about I know about this. What the fuck? Or as I should say to piss off all of our Australian listeners, the Battle of Brisbane. <laughs> I know about this because I was fascinated by the Papuan campaign and actually wrote my battle analysis paper at the Captain's Career course on a specific engagement in the uh, the Papuan campaign, basically the turning point of the Battle of Bunagona at the end of 1942 into like New Year's Day 1943. That's how I know about Herman Botcher. That's how I know all about how much it fucking sucked in the South Pacific, particularly in New Guinea. Uh, that's how I knew about Adabrin, uh, Hell yeah! from reading about it. And I also knew that, yeah, their, 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 their forward training marshalling location and R&R spot and like sort of like a um, refit spot was, yeah, Queensland. That's how I know about that. Oh, we're getting there. Have you heard of the Brisbane line? Do you know this story? Yes. This is, this is, it's kind of apocryphal, but the truth is that... The Australian government had a plan that if the Japanese invaded Australia, they were just going to write off everything north of Brisbane. I'm like, y'all are fucked in North Queensland, Northern Territory. Doesn't matter. Well, what you do is you retreat far enough back so the Japanese have to fight the emus, in which case <laughs> the Japanese will then lose to the, the angry birds of prey. But, but also, you know, Australia had like, like 5 million people and, and 3.5 million of them have been requisitioned by the British Army to get shot at Dunkirk or something like that. And so... They should have requisitioned the emus. The war would have been over years. It was, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. The war would have been over. Hitler, Hitler would have been born aloft by flightless <laughs> birds somehow. Uh, his the, fucking stupid face like pecked out of his head. Just yeah, that guy walking down the street in like Manchester, drunk off off his mind in fucking at like nine in the morning, being like, "Hey, sir, fucking emu!" Like that would actually be like a Veterans Day parade. He'd be honoring troops there. Um, the the, the Australian government's secret plan was that they would write off everything north of Brisbane. They called it the Brisbane Line. It was supposed to be secret, but MacArthur's a moron and fucking blew up the spot. And at a press conference, like, well, I've heard about the Brisbane Line, but don't worry, we, we won't do that. We'll defend all of Australia with the American, you know, the Allied forces. And Australians were like, wait, what, what's, what's, what's the Brisbane Line? <laughs> well, it's like all the, like during the Cold War, the U.S. had certain cities. They just accepted we're going to get nuked and did nothing to protect them. <laughs> yeah, everyone was just going to go to Seattle. Miami, fucked. Fucked. Yeah. Tallahassee, I mean, good. My, Tallahassee, fucked. Atlanta, probably fucked. Yeah. I think I'd brought, I, I, Detroit definitely was on the top of the line to get nuked, I'm sure. I mean, they make machines there. They used know? to. <laughs> American soldiers arrived in Australia virtually as soon as the US and Japan fully entered World War II. For instance, Pearl Harbor was attacked on December 7th, and US soldiers arrived in the land down under before the end of the month. Australia made a lot of sense as a hub for American soldiers during the rapidly expanding and at this point unsteady war in the Pacific. It was a logistics hub, a medical treatment area, is a good place to dump soldiers, marines, sailors, whatever, on the beaches for rest and relaxation as their mental health quickly imploded from the stresses of war. After all, it's kind of sad to be hard when you're on a beach, assuming it's not one of, you know, the beaches that marines were normally at. <laughs> Yeah, it's not Betio. It's not the the Marshall Islands, the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, etc. I'm gonna go on a nice vacation to this uh, place. I think it's called Tarawa. It yeah, nice. uh, I heard Guadal Guadal Canal. That sounds yeah. pretty nice. I think I nice like that eternal joke. Getting waterboarded at Guantanamo Bay sounds wonderful. If you know what any of those things mean. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I'm just thinking about it, like it does make sense. It was like, yeah, Australia makes sense. It's like, well, it's an allied country. You can. Just, just, just turn, turn your heading extremely southwest from uh, from Hawaii and get there. And after a few weeks, I think back in those days, I don't know. Uh, also, the Japanese had fucking just, 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 just curb stomped literally everything, and we're just on the march. And the only thing that stopped them from fucking getting further was the. Ins they insisted on making their guys walk over the goddamn Owen Stanley Mountains in New Guinea. And so they got to Port Moresby, literally within sight of Port Moresby. And they're like, all right, time to attack. And I was like, sorry, all the men are dead. <laughs> they're all dead. They were all killed by General Mosquito. Yeah, they were, they were, they were, they were fucking, they were killed by, exactly, by malaria, jungle rot, the itch, um, some sorcery, you know, I'm sure one or two of them was like, oh, that's a delicious pig those Bushmen have, I'll just take it, they won't mind, and wound up a delicious meal. Uh, yeah, it's, it's New Guinea, interesting place, just saying. Most of the American camps are plopped on in northern Australia, around major cities like Townsville, Cairns, Brisbane, and Rockhampton, though... 
I use the term major cities pretty loosely here because World War II Brisbane, for example, had a population of about 325,000 compared to about like 2 million today. 2 million. Yeah. yeah I've, I've been, I, I went to Australia for a combined joint exercise in 2011 and uh, Brisbane was the only major city I went to. I spent almost all of my time in Rocky. So Australians were just like, I was, wait, wait, really? You did that? And I was like, yeah, I tell them the story. I'm like, yep. Before we toured for Trash Future, I'd only been to Australia to spend a few hours in Brisbane and then like a month in Rockhampton. And I flew Anchorage to San Francisco to Sydney to Brisbane to Rocky all that in one go. That sounds fucking miserable. It's like, it's, it's like flying from fucking New Zealand to, and you're like, I can't wait to see America. I'm going to Lawton, Oklahoma. <laughs> and that's all you see. The Australian government was more than happy to absorb as many American military personnel as the U.S. was able to throw at them. This is from the Anzac portal, quote, the Australian government, lacking confidence in Australia's capability to defend itself, had expressed its willingness to accept a supreme commander in the Southwest Pacific Theater, initially from either Great Britain or the United States. Although MacArthur's appointment had been discussed for some time, it was only confirmed after the devastating loss of the Philippines to the Japanese. Australia's security became a vital link in the future American offensive against Japan, providing a base for which they could fight the Pacific War. From the Australian perspective, the U.S. offered the opportunity for strategic protection as well as the acquisition of weapons and personnel from which to fight the Japanese. And at these early stages of the Pacific War, with the Philippines taken by the Japanese and the Imperial Army on effectively Australia's doorstep, who, who could really blame them? If they had actually taken Port Moresby, it would be like, a, I think, a two hour flight from the from Australia's northern coast. Like Darwin is not a particularly uh, connected to the rest of settled Australia area. Uh, the northern territory is huge. And, and, and that the the that point at which, you know, the the, the the peninsula up there where Darwin is, is very far away. But once you're in. It's not like they. Can, it's easy for the Australians to mount a defense. As I said before, like basically every single able-bodied man had been fucking, you know, requisitioned and shipped abroad to do ultra Gallipoli, <laughs> and so they just like they didn't have anyone to defend. Yeah, yeah. Now, soon thousands of Americans were showing up in Australia in such numbers. It fundamentally changed the way Australia worked, both locally and nationally. For example, Brisbane, the focus of our episode here. Um, its population ballooned by 90,000 members of the American military. Maybe that's why they like them. I don't know. They like Americans in, in Queensland. I don't know. I've never been to a place where like buying a coffee and the, the, the young woman making the coffee is like, oh, I love your accent. Like, no one says that. <laughs> No one loves my accent. I love that Midwestern American accent. Yeah, I love. I, yeah, please, I love. I, God, I love that. If that, I bump that into weird... you, will you say "ope"? <laughs> yeah, I definitely will. <laughs> I'm guilty. I'm 100 really guilty of that. Oh, all the fuck! I don't even know I'm doing it. I do it all. I'm the sure time. Dutch people are so confused when I'm like, "Oop, let me just squeeze past you there," and like the local Albert Hein or whatever. <laughs> yeah. What's this guy talking about? What's ope? What the fuck is "ope"? I think this guy wants to buy some pornography. <laughs> Sorry, I, I like Dutch people. I don't. Wanna, I, I, don't I have wanna, no complaints wanna, thus far. Honestly. I don't want. I don't want to trade in, in cheap jokes. But 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 Dutch, there's a there's a bluntness about Dutch people that can be very funny sometimes. Uh, let's let's just say though, when it comes to Australia, yeah. Also, just bear in mind. I mean, it's it's a big country. It's hard to get around now. In the 1940s, it was far. I mean, it was it was perceived in the Commonwealth as being kind of a backwater that just produced a lot of cattle and sheep. And, uh, you know, obviously Mel Melbourne was the biggest city in the British Empire at one point. Sydney was not yet that size, but like Melbourne and Sydney are very, very far from Brisbane. Like yeah. Australia is on the one of those places like, that continues to amaze me. It's, it's something that I've often joked about, like living in Europe or the Caucasus. There's like people fundamentally do not understand how big the United States is. And the, I am guilty that, like, I occasionally forget just how fucking massive Australia is. Well, yeah, Dar Darwin, is, like, think of the, Australia is basically the size of the 48 contiguous states of the U.S. So Darwin, when you think about its position, is basically in, like, Winnipeg, Manitoba. And Melbourne is in, like, it's like going to Destin or, I don't know, fucking like the southern coast of Alabama, or at a bare minimum, if, if that's too too far, it's at least like being in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Like, imagine, yeah, like, 
trying to having to explain this when planning our tour there. Can you, that, can you describe it to me in burgers, please? <laughs> That's the only way I can understand things. So you'll probably at least count around three to four hundred highway exits with signs for Burger Kings when you make the drive between the two. Uh, we talked about because we drove when we toured Australia from Sydney to Canberra to Melbourne, and that's that's a long drive. But I had to convince my my co-host. I was like, no, we need to fly from Brisbane to Sydney because. To put it in terms you'll understand, driving from Brisbane to Sydney is like driving from Detroit to, at a bare minimum, Tallahassee, but probably more like Miami. Jeez. It's, a, it, it, it's, it's, it's not a fun drive, especially if you hate driving long distances. And also, like most of the way, it's like not a very big road because it's like it's a huge country. And I think there's like 30 million people in Australia. Hmm. And it's like one of the most urbanized countries on Earth. So like Brisbane's a a big city it's the biggest city in the area but then it's basically just bush all the way until you get to like i mean i'm, I'm gonna be a little bit rough here but like like newcastle i think before you get to like that part of new south wales like there aren't very many big cities on the way like big towns the nearest big city is yeah newcastle which is not that big and then sydney which is like six million people local australian businesses of all kinds changed rapidly to accommodate this massive influx of Americans. This included hotels, bars, nightclubs, all being able to stay open later as they previously would have. And of course, jacking up the prices on fucking everything. And that's because the average American soldier made double that of an Australian soldier and business owners would be goddamn if they're going to miss out on that bag. As you can imagine, this infuriated Australian soldiers who suddenly found themselves getting screwed every time they went out drinking and found everything more expensive. It also meant that local owners were much more likely to give better treatment and service to Americans over their own countrymen so they could get more money. I'll be honest with you. Those poor Australian troops were revenged in 2011 when I was there because it was in the middle of the commodities boom and the Australian dollar was actually more valuable than the US dollar. <laughs> So Burger King was like $30. Buying a coffee at the kiosk in like the Rockhampton Hospital, one of our troops got hurt, I had to go visit him, was like six fifty for a coffee in 2011. Like, Revenge comes full circle in enough decades, baby. It was so unbelievably expensive. So they got their fucking revenge. They got their revenge. You know what? It only took 70 years, but it happened. Of course, with two different cultures of soldiers and people who desperately wanted to make money off of them, meant that Americans came in and opened their own American-centric bars and clubs, as well as the American military opening their own bars, which they did used to do. And then they expanded the postal exchange system. Now, for people who are not aware, the postal exchange, or PX, is a kind of private store only available for use by the American military and their dependents. Most of the time, back in the day, and also as today as well, the selection in these stores is oftentimes better than in the local economies, as well as being normally cheaper because you don't have to pay local taxes on the price of goods. You don't pay sales tax and it's, there's no import tax. And similarly, like the commissary, it's like the military is emphatically not a socialist organization, but it has an at-cost grocery store that is basically like it's the closest you can get to like that concept. The commissary doesn't make any profit. It just sells stuff at cost. Yeah, it rules. It fucking rules. It rules. It's fucking amazing. It, and also you can get anywhere the U.S. military has been, they'll have fucking products from that. So you can be, like I said, be in Lot in Oklahoma or Dongdachan, South Korea, and you can get, I mean, American stuff like you'd want, but then like random products, you're like, oh, I, I guess we can get Hawaiian niche hawaiian foods flavored spam here we can also and get none of it's feet. like in any increased price none no it's great yeah yeah that's why they they it's kind of it, it, it it's at best rude and at worst racist but when they talk about the land of the big px it's just sort of like america the idea that like you know you get stationed overseas and that local local women want to marry americans because they can finally go to america where life is easier and shit's you know cheaper and stuff's available and yeah you we have burger everything you know the the, the roads the, the streets aren't paved with gold they're paved with burger <laughs> which explains why the roads are in such shit shape yeah exactly they just keep fucking just all that all that sauce just fucking tires have no purchase whatsoever and like especially back in the day like that i mean it's not so much the case now but like you know after world war ii when most of the world where the u.s military happened to be stationed like might not be so bad to hit your wagon when these soldiers going home and get your get a, a ticket out of like your devastated homeland. My my grandmother came from a family of four, I believe, and she and her sister both married American airmen and moved to America. Um, and she was a, like, profoundly traumatized by the Blitz. 
Um, but she managed to, well, she managed to find the dude who knocked her up and make his command make him marry her. So <laughs> there you have it. I think um, like 20,000 Australian women married American military personnel, which is not a small part of that population. Uh, back when you then. think about how, yeah, how small of a country it, it still is, but especially was back yeah. then. Now, all of this was especially true during World War II when it comes to the PX, and even more so in Australia, as a lot of things that it carried in the store were just completely unavailable in Australia due to rationing, or if they were, the prices were so outrageous, they were completely unobtainable for normal people. So if you were in the American military, you had free access to these things at much lower prices. Now, these stores were only available to the American military, not the Australians, while the Australian military stores were open to Americans. So the Americans had free reign over both of them. So if Americans, you had like a me circa 1941, who's like a weeb for Australia, and you're just like, oh, I'm gonna go buy Vegemite. Like he could go in. Yeah, Vegemite and nothing else. <laughs> All the Vegemite and, you know, I don't know, Bonds. I don't think they made Bonds underwear back then, but they definitely had the, the fucking, what is it, Bundaberg rum? That was around. I, th- I feel like know? Vegemite was one of the few things that probably weren't rationed. <laughs> yeah, you probably had you probably had Vegemite to your heart. But you never know. I mean, like weird, weird shit's happening. I mean, where else am I supposed to get my koala meat cutlets or whatever? I don't know fucking anything about Australia. <laughs> Dude, they eat crocodile. That I'll tell you that and kangaroo, obviously, but like that's not exactly like hot like oat cuisine, but people In Florida eat alligators. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, it's it's not it's not weird you would either. Like it's 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 edible, it's good. And I mean quite frankly, like if I went through the effort of killing a crocodile, I'd want to eat it to like have something to show Look, for if it. If something is going to eat you, you have to be able to eat it back to show dominance. Exactly. That's why I love eating wolf meat. Please don't check my blood for parasites. <laughs> I could feel them crawling behind my eyes. Of course, this not only led to jealousy. But rampant, skyrocketing crime as American soldiers did what anyone would do in their situation and started selling PX shit on the black market to Australians, making an absolute fuckload of money. Squads, platoons, and entire units would effectively act as gangs competing with one another over turf who are doing the same thing and would routinely fight and even kill one another over that sweet, sweet Australian dollar. So it's basically a three-way handshake between... The Australia in the 1940s and World War II, South Korea basically forever until currently. South Korea became a developed country, <laughs> yeah, currently pretty much, uh, and the U.S. military in West Germany in the 80s. And it's like, it was a rather ma- handshake slash Venn diagram of you've got black market profiteering, uh, nationality-based exclusion, troops murdering each other. Uh, I'll go one further. The U.S. military in the United States during the era of when the PX did not tax cigarettes... Because when I was living, uh, when I was stationed in Kentucky, I was stationed at Fort Knox. And this uh, tradition of soldiers engaging in black market uh, trade because of lack of taxes and the PX, like I did this in, the, in like 2006, um, six or seven, when I was in uh, Fort Knox, I could buy incredibly depreciated cigarettes uh, because uh, cigarettes were cheaper in Kentucky but also even cheaper in the PX. So I would buy several cartons of them, put them in my car, and on like long weekends when I'd drive back to Michigan to visit my family, I would sell them in the neighborhood. <laughs> I mean, I remember being at the National Training Center in 2008, and I smoked back then, and I remember a pack of Cools was like three fifty at and the, the, the PX or shop at, at NTC. And let's just say it was not three fifty in fucking regular California stores. Like it was like nine or ten dollars. Now this led to something else, and it's probably something that uh, everybody listening saw coming. American soldiers began winning over Aussie women. The Australian mid complained that American soldiers' uniforms looked much nicer than theirs, and combined with the fact they made significantly more money than they did, and the Americans had candy, silk stockings, and other things they could lavish upon the local women. They were leaving the poor Aussie men behind for the new arriving Americans. Truth. These yank cunts stealing all shayless. I swear to God, I'm not making this up. Um, this is, now, this is, of course, how the Australian men saw things. Um, and this is from a News 9 article. Quote, historian and author Robert Macklin said, it started because 
the Americans were getting off with the pretty girls of Brisbane, and the Australians are feeling pretty much left out of it. The Americans had the smart uniforms, they had the PX materials, they had nylon stockings and turkeys and ice cream and all, all that they could lavish upon their ladies, and the Australians had pretty much nothing. Now, like, nobody's ever going to accuse me of having game in any way whatsoever, but could you imagine being a woman in a sweaty, newly arrived American soldier in their dress uniform slaps a whole fucking turkey down on top of a bar? It's like, what's up, girl? It's like, I might not have game, but I got game birds. What up? <laughs> and... It works. Like, hey, yo, Miss Lady, we got a whole goddamn backpack of fucking ice cream back in the barracks. Actually, this shit, this shit's melting fast as hell. So you better get down there, right? I should point out here, in case anybody is thinking otherwise, that according to the Australian women themselves, this had nothing to do with it. Because of course it didn't. According to the Queensland Historical Atlas, women simply thought that the newly arriving Americans were nicer than their own Australian men. This is the direct quote. Quote. Even the official war historian Gavin Long notes, although not in an entirely critical way, Australians have always treated their women as little worse than their dogs. Therefore, the Americans who have usually been taught to respect women have displayed some tenderness towards Australian women and have stolen most of the pretty girls. (laughs) Also, I mean, let's be perfectly honest here. It would be very difficult to get American soldiers to the point where they would be like, I think it's funny to put a funnel in my ass and drink a beer that way. Uh, whereas I have, uh, uh, many of us have heard of the Australian butt chug. So all I can say is that I imagine if you're used to the latter, the former, as uptight and weird and gauche as Americans can be, I mean, they're not sticking funnels in their ass to fucking dump Victoria Bitter down it. And also, the, apparently, they have turkeys and ice cream. They just, of course. You, you fucking, you, you rob an American in Australia in 1940 something, Grand Theft Auto style, and like <laughs> ice cream sandwiches and turkey just fall out of their pockets. And like, <laughs> there's also like the tried and true thing that like anybody who's ever lived anywhere that like could be understood as a tourism spot knows like this has nothing to do with the quality of the people. It's just the fact that they're different. Well, they're different. They're new. It's like it's like it, yeah, going to Iceland if you're a foreigner, and it's like you're just kind of a novelty. If, like if you're if you're single and you're you're interested, you'll probably be able to meet someone just because like it's a country of three hundred thousand people and everyone knows each I other. Mean, soldiers are soldiers are effectively no different than anyone else who travels uh, by the seat of their pants, quite literally, because they just like go around trying to fuck every lo- like every new local they they land in, like backpackers, tourists, quote unquote expats, like everybody fucking does it. And they're they're all trying like Australians in this context are framing it as like the Americans stole our women because like, you know, they're quote unquote property. And the Australian women are saying, well, they treated me better. Meanwhile, like we're both Americans. We've been around soldiers. I'm like, how much better could they have been? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like game recognized game. But also this guy has the unfair advantage of a butterball turkey. So you know, like in the end, that might be the tipping, the tipping point. I open up my dress uniform. I have silk stockings on one side and melting ice cream in the, in the Australian heat in the other. <laughs> it's very funny, too, because that concept of the guy who opens his coat and has all this bullshit, like we kind of have the image, but not the word. The Brits actually have a word for that guy. The guy who's got the coat, he, like the hat and the coat, and not a flasher, not a pervert, but he opens it up and it's got like watches and stolen shit. They call it a spiv. <laughs> We don't have a word for that. No, we just have like Frank, the guy who has the jacket full of turkey meat. Yeah, yeah. They also, the, 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 we, we sell shoplifted meat out of the back of a car in the parking lot of the grocery store it was shoplifted from. The Brits sell it down the pub. A guy just comes and opens his coat and he's got fucking Tom stolen Tom has meat. told me that story on multiple occasions. I've had, I've had people offer me stolen food in, in the pub numerous times too. Like it's just a thing I that going to the right pubs. Now, somewhat hilariously, this became so well known that being Americans tearing their way across Australia by their balls that the Japanese used it in uh, in propaganda against Australian soldiers pointing out that while they were fighting the Japanese in like New Guinea some American from Nebraska was fucking their girlfriend back home <laughs> I'm just imagining like the Australians you know getting galvanized against the Yankee imperialists I mean I guess you can't really use that kind of language that's more Cold War stuff isn't it because the Japanese if anything it's not like the Japanese are like oh look at those awful imperialists it's like meanwhile uh, but it's more like <laughs> they have basically been like dear Australian Tommies got some bad news for you there's this person named Jody we're not even sure of their gender but Jody's got 
your girl or your guy, whomever. And they're gone. Jody exists. Jody's in Brisbane. Jody's just just laying pipe. <laughs> jo- jo- Jody is fucking doing a full plumbing install across the entirety of North Queensland. <laughs> they're redoing the plumbing infrastructure from the ground up. Yeah, exactly. All the, the, they don't, you all don't even need a septic tank. You've got pipe laid end to end across every acre of the place. Meanwhile, you are here in between three interlocking fields of fire that we have dialed in. And you are going to die. As your dick and balls rot off in the jungle, like humidity, some some dude who probably never went to school and got conscripted from the farm is just laying waste to your family life. Meanwhile, the most you can hope for is that the crocodile that's going to eat you might at least tongue your butthole a little bit before it does. Ah, I see the crocodiles in New Guinea are very, uh, very courteous. Well, king, they, the king, king crocodile. Just, no. Oh, no, we've invented no, the king that. No, that. The king. <laughs> No. <laughs> now, another problem was the perception that the two sides had towards one another. Despite the fact that the U.S. and the Australians were obviously allies and the Australian media and government was doing everything it could to hype up their new neighbors and win over American public back home in the U.S. with the importance of defending Australia from the Empire of Japan, that's about where the respect ended. Like you talked about, the Supreme Commander in the Pacific, Douglas MacArthur, did not exactly think very highly of Australian soldiers and told any no. of his peers that would listen just as much. He also didn't really think very highly of American soldiers. He just thought highly of not, himself. He, yeah, he's just a huge dickhead. Yeah. Yeah. Where Australian and American troops are fighting in New Guinea, the Australians were doing virtually all of the heavy lifting in that department. American soldiers were told of the hard-fighting victories of the Americans, but nothing of the Australians. And in fact, the Australians at best were slowing them down. So obviously, American soldiers saw their Australian hosts as terrible soldiers who shirked their duties and completely relied on their Yankee Doodle Sigma chinned American brothers to do everything when that could not be further from the truth. In fact, on one occasion while fighting alongside Australian soldiers, the raw, unproven American soldiers in Brunagona literally dropped their rifles and ran from combat in full view of their allies. So you had Americans full of themselves with fat paychecks, silk pantyhose, jackets full of ice cream or whatever and seeing themselves as god's gift to australia and australians uh, and not to mention australian soldiers are now priced out of their own bars watching some foreign dudes mac on local women all while treating them like shit to see them as like they're, they're unable to fight you know in short a bunch of australians are looking around going like yo what the fuck i mean also the Australian army's field craft when it comes to jungle warfare is hard fought and won in terms of how they acquired it. And famously, one of the critiques of the American troops deployed to uh, Queensland and then subsequently to New Guinea was that like they were out doing exercises in like fucking big open cattle pastures. And it's like Australians were even making this point at the time, like, hey, guys, we, we, we got some jungles. We got some rainforests. <laughs> you might want to train in those. Nah, just I mean, they're fine. Already, just practice out the bar of, with all the turkey uh, based yeah, games. Not a lot of, not a lot of pastures. And open fields in, in the Owen Stanley Mountains and the highlands of New Guinea or the north coast of New Guinea. Rabal does not look like Odessa, Texas. It might well, now with that attitude, you can make it look like Odessa, Texas. Now, another big hitching problem between the two of them were the military police. Ah, now, yeah. Australian military police are seen as a little more than rejects by their fellow soldiers. And that is because the job of the MP generally fell to dudes who couldn't qualify for service, for anything else. And those men largely acted like it. They were doing a job that nobody else wanted to do, including themselves. So they kind of had a live and let live attitude towards their fellow Australian soldiers. They wouldn't bother people as long as you didn't bother them. They were also unarmed and had very little authority in the first place. Which is like, you put American troops in a situation like that, and that's like the fucking rats finding all the dodo bird eggs <laughs> on the island of Mauritius. And you're like, oh, you think they make a law against this? It's just fucking delicious. Just gobbling them There's down. There's a reason why American soldiers have to be policed by psychotic American police, because it's the only thing that keeps us in line. The poor fighting Tommy of Australia has not yet met Marine Todd, comma, MP. Like, just, like, not member of parliament, military police. Speaking of American military police, now, Nate and I have a fair amount of experience with military police, but American military police have a vastly different attitude that is just the about the same as normal American police culture in general, even today. They're aggressive, 
they're violent, and they're armed. They also had broad powers that covered not only American soldiers, but Australian ones. And the Australians were not fucking happy about this, and this will become very important later. But not everything was Americans pissing off Australians. There was one major issue that infuriated Americans, and it is not something I'll say you probably see coming from a country like Australia in the 1940s, namely race relations. Now, for those who are unaware, Australia is a deeply fucking racist country. It still is, and it definitely was back in the time that we're talking about. Indigenous Australians were, and still are in a lot of ways, living in a segregated society away from white Australian life and society. They wouldn't even be given citizenship until 1949 and the right to vote until 1960s. Yeah. Also, Queensland in particular comes into attention here because Queensland, there's a practice called blackbirding where people were basically press ganged into slavery from Pacific Islands. So the, uh, Queensland is, 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 is particularly considered worse than the rest of Australia. When you think about the fact that Australia had the white Australia policy until like, like 1970, where you couldn't emigrate there if you weren't white, like that's saying something. But Queensland in particular, where Brisbane is, uh, has its, its, its reputation today is influenced by this, but just understand the circumstances that like it's a place where you know, cattle and also sugarcane plantations and people were enslaved there. It wasn't slavery in this in, in, in the, like, you know, the Atlantic slave trade the way that it was in America and in the Caribbean, but it was slavery. Right. Not everything has to look like chattel slavery to be ch- slavery. Exactly. And, 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 and so that is a thing to understand the dynamic. Now, I don't know where this is going. I don't know if they're like the Australians are too nice to non-white people or if it's you're not going to expect what happens next. I'm, I am ready to have my weeb for Australia brain fucking explode. So when thousands of African-American military personnel showed up in Australia, Australians are actually fine with it. This requires some explanation. The Australian government was, and soldiers, society in general, were deeply, and still are, deeply fucking racist against indigenous Australians. However, they saw black Americans as fine, because they were not indigenous Australians. And it also helped they had the exact same paycheck as their white peers, meaning they didn't give a single fuck about American segregation when it came to businesses because their money spent all the same. Soon, white American soldiers were pissed that Australians were serving black Americans right alongside them at bars and clubs, and Australian women seemed just as happy to go home with one of them as they were the whites. And... Before long, you had episodes of white American soldiers attacking black American soldiers for daring to talk to a white woman or go to their bars, only for Australian soldiers to jump in and defend them. And then when the MPs showed up, the Australians seeing MPs as little more than shitheaded rejects on a power trip would fight them too. You know, I've forgotten the details of the episode title because my brain leaks. Like when you strain water out of pasta and you put it in the bowl with holes in it, the sieve, colander if you call it, however, strainer even. However, wasn't this also the source of comparable, you know, uh, intra-ally race rioting in England? Yeah. It led to the Battle of Bamber Bridge, which we did an episode about. Yeah. For, for effectively the same reasons, um, practicality, but also British racism is just significantly different than American racism. Different. It's, it, and, and, and Australia is... is uh, Australian friends of mine have told me that when they get back, who, who've lived in London and they get back to Australia to visit, they're like, wow, I've gone back in, in time 30 years in terms of racism. And I'm like, wait, you feel that coming from fucking England? Yeah. So yeah, yeah it's bad. I mean, but it's also different. Yeah. I mean, and also like segregation and as so far as American segregation was never a thing. It was, it was, but not everywhere. It was in places in the Northern Territory. It was in places, I think Queensland I mean, had specifically it. in like the United Kingdom, hence why, it, hence why it led to Bamber Bridge. But also in the, in the Australian context of it, there was, of course, there was segregation. But when it came to black Americans, they were seen as, well, they're not indigenous. That's different. So one of the reasons why, if you watch the video for David Bowie's Let's Dance, which came out in 1983, why the locals in, the white Australian locals in this bar in the Northern Territory, it's what I think they call, they call a hotel, sort of like, like pub in a, in a small kind of, you know, in a town that's big enough to have one, are kind of weirded out by all of it and like not doing a very good job of pretending the camera isn't there is because the sort of heroes, the protagonists of the story told in the music video are indigenous Australian kids. And... That bar in 1983 was a bar where 
it was either officially indigenous Australians couldn't go or it was de jure in the sense of, right, what's that? I'm using it wrong. It was de facto in the sense that like, you just didn't because you, you knew better. Be served. Yeah. You knew better. Exactly. Like that's how recent it is slash was. Like it's, it, it, and it's like, whereas in America, like we'll go to great lengths to be racist to the point where we make things less efficient and way less convenient for ourselves. The whole point of the way America works is that it can't be equal. Like Absalom, Absalom was basically an instruction manual for white Americans. It was like, oh wait, there was some miscegenation in your family? Fucking burn everything down and kill everyone. Right. Like it's it's bad. That's not saying Australia is better, but it's different. Yeah, it, it's different isn't always better. <laughs> no, but to the mentality of Australians in the 1940s compared to um, white American troops, like the absence of that hard line segregation always enforced, you never transgress. Like I could understand why Australians would be like, wait, what the fuck? Like we do a perfectly good job of being insanely racist. What the fuck's wrong with and you? That's effectively what it boiled down to like, wow, this is like, we wouldn't do this to black people. <laughs> you, know, you know, like, yeah, but, but weirdly that's black is the term they would use. And back in those, those days, especially for indigenous Australians. Right. It's just very right, like they wouldn't, they wouldn't do that to like black Americans, black Americans. Yeah. Cause, 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 you're American more. And yeah. that's the thing. It's like Brits with class. Like it's not to say they're not racist, but class stuff winds up kind of trumping things. It's like for America, nothing can trump race. That's Pretty my much. opinion, but that's how I feel about it. that's in my experience as a white American is that that's how white Americans think that like there is no, there is no other delimiter that can interfere with that specific hire. That's how America has always been. And until people get over that, it's going to be a fucking nightmare. You know, and like this kind of weird, like racial crime within, um, uh, like the hate crime between U members of the U.S. military and then like them being defended by Australians happens so much. The U.S. military enforced segregation within Brisbane, despite it technically being against Australian law at the time, and then Australia effectively being forced to go along with it. Black soldiers were not allowed to cross the south side of the Brisbane River, and this was to be enforced by military police. And as a fuck you, the Australian military police and the Australian military are just like, we're not going to do that. Which is weird because if I remember correctly, Brisbane was a sundown town for indigenous Australians. For indigenous Australians. Yeah. yeah. But like when they saw a, a, an African-American in an American military uniform, they didn't get the racism. That's different. Why are you doing it? It's one of those mind bending it, because it's like, it's one of those things we've talked about multiple times in the show. It's like no one ever accused a racist person of being intelligent. Sure. Or being consistent or making sense. Because you can't rational, you can't use rational thinking to rationalize someone out of a uh, position they got themselves into irrationally, which is exactly what's happening. Like, well, the Australians are like coming to the violent defense of african-american soldiers indigenous australians weren't even allowed to enlist no they weren't citizens if they left the country they weren't allowed to come back in like they weren't even fucking citizens until 1949 <laughs> yeah i mean I, a, a, an offhand comment made by an australian nco when i was there in 2011 was that basically like the the army sort of apocryphal army lingo story about this was that pre-1967 if they saw indigenous australians like wandering onto a range they just shoot jesus them. christ and like they thought this was funny to tell the story and we we're just like it's pretty that's to say up, nothing of American's history with Native Americans, which we've talked about forever yeah. oh, on the show. It's just as bad. It's just it's just that it's 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 less yes, recent. So exactly we've... that's a, yeah, that's a, that's what I was getting towards is like all this stuff in Australia is so much more recent. Um, like in comparison, Native American citizens in the twenties, I believe, it was like nineteen twenty or nineteen nineteen or something. So like it's still not that long ago, but it's not not nineteen forty nine. Um, but you know. The, the, While well, the Australian military police refused to enforce the segregation, unfortunately for everybody else, the Americans were more than happy to pick up the racism slack. American MPs declared open season on any black soldier who dared to cross the Brisbane River, and they killed several of them. Now, Good God. just because there was segregation of black soldiers from white soldiers did not mean white soldiers couldn't cross the river, and they often did. It wasn't uncommon for white soldiers to cross the river, commit hate crimes, and only then to be stopped by Australians because American MPs didn't care. Uh, uh, this is going to sound fucked up, and I'm not trying to make light of it, but like just the sheer... It must be very strange for an Australian to perceive this and be like, you have just made the arduous journey of 
getting from America to Australia, a 14 and a half hour flight from Southern California now on a boat to bring your troops here. And now you're killing them because of American racism. You're killing each other because of American racism. It's like, you are insane. Yeah, it's the one thing, like, no matter what theater that the U.S. military is in during World War II, they imported this everywhere. Like, we talked about this during their Battle of Bamber Bridge episode, and they did the same thing in other occupations. Now, by November 1942, not even a full year into the Americans showing up, military police would routinely report at least 20 Yank against Aussie fights per day in Brisbane alone. And all of that brings us to Thanksgiving of 1942 and what would become the Battle of Brisbane. Every American in the city, because you know it's Thanksgiving, had the day off for the holiday, and they spent the whole time getting piss-ass drunk. And on top of already bad relations, this set the stage for really anything to blow wildly out of proportion should something come up. So one American private named James Stein had spent his day drinking at a hotel until it closed at about 7 p.m., and then he made for the PX to stock up on more alcohol and continue drinking. He was on the corner of Creek and Adelaide Streets and ran to some Aussie soldiers who he was cool with, and they were talking to one another. But before long, an American MP showed up named Anthony O'Sullivan and demanded Stein's paperwork, that you know his, his, uh, his pass form, that said that he was allowed to be out. He took his sweet ass time getting it, you know, because he had spent hours drinking to the point his hands no longer really worked and we've all been there before. But O'Sullivan began giving him shit for taking so long. And when Stein finally found his pass and showed it to him, O'Sullivan just decided to arrest him anyway. The Australian soldiers that he was with uh, began telling the MP to fuck off and leave Stein alone. So O'Sullivan pulled out his baton and hit one of the Australians, which caused all three of them to start beating the shit out of the MP. More MPs came rushing to the scene, which caused the rest of the Australians in the area, dozens of whom were just watching the scene unfold in front of them, military and civilian alike, to rush to the aid of their own men. Soon, a multinational civil military alliance was beating the fuck out of the MPs who said they, they had seen enough of this Aussie smoke and retreated into the PX and locked themselves inside. Doing a Saigon embassy in the PX. <laughs> try, try desperately to get lift off by a helicopter while you're just having cartons of cigarettes under your arms. Yeah, she's like, please invent road wing a- aviation and get us out of this mess. The cause of the entire situation was now lost. It didn't matter anyone t- to any, anybody that was watching. Once word started to go around that some American MPs clubbed an Aussie, that's all that was needed. Soon over 100 Aussies gathered outside the PX to start throwing bottles and bricks, smashing out the windows. Stein, the spark of this entire incident when the Australians came to his aid, now had to also run inside the PX for cover as other Aussies showed up again beating his ass as just seeing him as another American. Within a few minutes, he was armed with a baton and he was standing along shoulder to shoulder with the MPs who had originally been trying to arrest him. Then an Australian cop showed up to see what the fuck was going on, and the crowd turned on him, forcing him to run across the street into a Red Cross building for cover, which also came under impromptu siege. Not even respecting the bloody Geneva Convention. (laughs) This is fucking cactus. By now, this shit was spreading through the city. Australians were talking to one another about what the MPs did, so some started decking random American soldiers when they saw him, which caused... Americans to tell one another that, hey, the Australians are just mugging us in the street. So now there's like roving gangs of Australians and Americans randomly beating each other up. And nobody is fucking sure why. Thousands of fights were erupting throughout Brisbane with nobody involved actually knowing why they were fighting. All these Australian women are at home with turkeys. Like, I don't know why we're supposed to eat these today, but I'm waiting for this fucking guy to get home so we can do it. I have all this ice cream and turkey, and I have no American. Where the fuck did he go? No American. Where are they? Yeah, exactly. Bayonet-wielding soldiers were ordered into the city to escort civilians out uh, as this like just continued to spiral out of control. Australian military police took off their uniforms that told anybody their MPs and joined in on the riots punching Americans, while American soldiers who hated their own MPs also began fighting them alongside the Australians in some places, only for the MPs to run. And then the Australians and the Americans had no no longer had any MPs to fight, so they just turned towards one another and started fighting one another. I feel like if I were 
an American soldier, I would just do like British sailor who jumps overboard and like swims to the shore of Hawaii or I don't know, indigenous Australia or fucking Starts anywhere. running like, through I'm the gonna outback. Jo- I'm, I'm, I'm just going to join your culture now. Like I'm just, I'm just going to become, I'm, I'm, I'm going to become, you know, like the, 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 the white adoptee. I don't want to be, I don't want to deal with the Royal Navy. I don't want to deal with rum sodomy in the lash <laughs> anymore. Or in this case, American military police. It's some Australian soldier clearing the streets with two snakes tied, their tails tied together as a weapon, throwing spiders at one another. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Just just doing doing magic tricks, like like opening their fingers like a magician and a huntsman spider pops out. <laughs> they, they invoke the swooping bird. It's Brisbane, so the swooping bird's gonna be there. They'll be like, listen, you fucked around long enough. It's time for us to escalate things for real. It's like a like a wizard casting Ultima. Like all of a sudden the fucking if you're not familiar with Australia and specifically Queensland, they have a kind of magpie that is insanely aggressive. And when it's the season, I believe in their mating season, they have to put out signs like, Be careful, there's a swooping bird around because it will chase you and fucking peck your ass. Like the swooping bird is just a risk you face. It, it- is probably more powerful than the Australian Air Force. <laughs> well, certainly at the time. Geez. Probably now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And like things were escalating so wildly and uh, so, like, nobody was trying to control anything. And in the middle of all of this, a group of Australian soldiers hijack a truck carrying machine guns and hand grenades and then crash it into a bar that catches on fire. I feel like when you have the truck with machine guns and hand grenades, you kind of want to use it for that and not just decide to make like Victoria Bitter sponsored VBID. <laughs> That's what the VB stands for. Victoria, Victoria Bitter IED. In a desperate attempt to get the ride under the control, the Brisbane Fire Department was set into this mess to use their fire hose, hoses to break up the crowds. And they pulled up, took one look at the situation, said, fuck this, and then drove back to the firehouse. Uh, afterwards, their commander told a local newspaper, quote, we have no intention of using our services to quell military or civilian riots. Our job is just to put out fires. It's not really good use of water, mate. <laughs> Hose isn't fucking strong enough for that shit. That shite. I can't even fucking talk like an Australian. I kind of can sometimes. I can, I can talk like the guy who saw the peace protest we were unintentionally walking into because our NCOIC liaison was an idiot while we were in uniform and looked at the protest and then looked at us and then waved at me and said, I might. <laughs> You got any guns that can borrow shoot these cunts for you? Like that I can do, but I can't really improv an Australian accent. Now, somehow, so far, not a single American MP had resorted to using firearms. And shockingly, neither had the Australians or American soldiers, despite the fact there was plenty of guns floating around the crowd by now. That was all about the change. Eventually, a group of MPs was dispatched to the PX armed with shotguns, which is pretty standard for what you could consider 1940s riot control. One of them was a guy named Norbert Grant. And as he approached the PX, he was the first one uh, that, that appeared with a shotgun. The furious sea of Aussies in front of him began screaming, look at that cunt, he has a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot me, cunt. Like the mood of the crowd fundamentally changed like from you know civil disobedience, you could say, to outright furious anger that he brought a gun into this. And they zerg rushed him, smacking him with bottles and sticks, cursing at him for bringing a shotgun to the streets of their city. Like they were beating the shit out of him. And Grant responded in the situation exactly like everybody listening probably thought he would. He fired three times. He hit seven people because it's a shotgun. And Aussie private Edward Webster died on the spot. This is so stupid. So it's just, <laughs> yeah, it all comes down to the MPs being fucking idiots. I mean, there's lots and lots of other ancillary things, but yeah, like this. Yeah, Im- import Americans, you get mass shootings, I guess. <laughs> less yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then everyone's like, all right, well, let's have a, let, let, let's have a peacemaking meal afterwards. And everyone gets a hamburger. <laughs> Hamburgers across Australia. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But no one, no one is actually hungry because they've had all these turkeys. <laughs> we've, we've flooded the market with uh, turkeys and ice cream, and you know all the Australians are full eating their traditional cuisine of wombat and snake. I don't know. Yeah, it's bangers and mass British food. In, in, like it, it, you know, inexplicably British food in a climate that's just not British. Boy, mate, you gonna eat that I mean, spider? <laughs> well, I'm not here to fuck spiders. <laughs> That's like a thing they say. Uh, kind of. It's the fuck does that even mean? Just laugh, 
like I'm not here to fuck around basically but like yeah it's just so much more uh, poetic to say I'm not here to fuck spider like that would be a, yeah I'm not either that would be a bit of a challenge the Australian prose is profound oh yeah, it's it, <laughs> I don't want to derail things even further but there I, I, I have one for you uh, uh, but I'm just thinking about this it's just like all because uh, basically they're like hey we're gonna do redlining and American style segregation and we we we've got fucking like cop voice being like you you're resisting arrest kind of shit, and it's led to a an a, 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 a intra ally riot at you know recreating 1975 in Saigon at the PX, and now a guy's shot because they did a mass shooting and he did spray and pray. And the 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 American cop that 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 started this instead of it being like a 45 year old guy who's been in the police force for 20 years and looks like a a thumb. Is like a nineteen-year-old named Norbert. No one. I was just like Norbert's a good name. I've only knew, known one person named Norbert in my life, and it was German. So I would say that's the world's most German-American. But wasn't his last name Grant? It's just like uh, world's your 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 extremely German dad or extremely German mom insisted on calling you Norbert, but your dad was like you know a dude named Joe Grant, and he was like whatever. I just I can't. I have no idea. It's just yeah. My brother's fourth-grade teacher was named Norbert Kut. In Germany, because we—that's where we lived, and that's the only person I've ever met with that name. And Mr. Herkut was a weird dude, so it's just a cursed name. And now I've got an even bigger association with that. Now I've got—I'd rather him be a German teacher than a eighteen-year-old, nineteen-year-old mass shooter. But you can't—you know, beggars can't be choosers. Yeah, I feel like I just wouldn't want to be nineteen in nineteen forty-two. I feel like that's time. just a bad age at a bad time. Yeah, you know, we complain about like being you know eighteen in the early two thousands because music sucked and we had like frosted tips and stuff. But like this is way worse. <laughs> I mean, the argument's still out on which one's worse. Frosted tips are pretty bad. Frosted tips, mass shooting. Hmm, who knows? Yeah. Well, I mean, unfortunately, thankfully, even in the early 2000s, you could also not have to worry about making that choice because it'd be made for you. Now, with seven people shot and one dead, things were about to be seriously cranked up. The, The Aussies refused to leave the streets. Now that everyone knew that an American MP had murdered someone, and what they had in their mind on night two was no longer so, you know, peaceful. What made everything worse in the situation was wartime news censorship. No crimes committed by Americans or Australians, for that matter, if they were in the military, were to be reported on in the newspaper. So people had no idea what was actually happening because it couldn't be reported on. People only learned about the riot through word of mouth. And rumors. And you can imagine what those rumors said. So before long... They came down and actually fucked spiders and then shot a guy. pinned down a huntsman spider, gave it the old what's for. Now, like, instead of a, a jumpy cop shooting a single Australian dead and wounding a few more, the rumors were Americans machine gunned dozens of Aussies. 15s were dead. Then it was 20. Now the Americans are driving tanks into the city. Shit like that. Rumors were getting wildly out of hand meanwhile the actual thing with machine guns was was australian soldiers hijacking a truck and doing st louis cop driving (laughs) (laughs) so now australians were still like pouring into the streets now they were armed they had knives they had guns and fucking hand grenades and they had gathered like up to 300 of them outside the px which had since been reinforced with hundreds of american soldiers and Australian cops, not to mention the Red Cross station just across the street. Just putting up T-walls around the PX, like, once again, it's just the, 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 the fucking, it's too on the nose. <laughs> it's too, be more subtle. Other groups of Aussies roamed the street looking for any American they could find. Civilian, military, did not matter, and beating the shit out of them. And for some reason, in the middle of all of this, neither the American nor uh, Australian commanders thought about confining their troops to, ba- to the bases to stop the riot. It's sort of like there is this whole thing called martial law you do in civilians, but like you don't have to worry about declaring martial law when you're already in the military. It's what you already have. It's, it's literally, it's just no law. No commanders made any attempt to really control the riot. I got confined to the fucking post because a soldier got a DUI in Korea. They want to just ruin our weekends. Like I wasn't fucking blasting a dude in the, in the dick with a shotgun over a fight over whether or not he was too drunk to be on pass. You know, I wasn't I wasn't doing a sacred battle and cleaving people in twain with a claymore sword, you know, to defend the PX. I was just just happened to be in the same brigade as a soldier who was an idiot. PX Volt. 
<laughs> now, at this point, hundreds of soldiers has, had made their way from the Red Cross station to right in front of MacArthur's office, which he wasn't there at the time. But one of MacArthur's aides <laughs> was... he never fucking would be ever. <laughs> yeah, one, of, one of MacArthur's aides was, and he was watched this scene from the window, quote, I had just left the barracks and was walking to the headquarters for my shift. When I got down to Queen Street, it seemed to be at a standstill. People were everywhere. Aussies were grabbing every American they could find and kicking the hell out of them. It didn't look so good. So I ran down the lane and made a run for the headquarters. The, the Aussies were militiamen, not regular soldiers. I could tell this by the bands on their hats. There had been more than 300. I was watching the events from the headquarters sixth floor. There's, they formed three circles in the crowd and were passing Americans in uniform over their heads into the circles where they were punching and kicking them. They only found 21 and they were taken to the hospital after being beat up. They formed mosh pits that were crowd surfing people into the middle I was of them. say, Australia, inventor of a lot of things to include the first Slipknot concert. <laughs> well, I just find that very funny too, the level of, of understatement in that it's just so American in general. I mean, to, to my ears, Midwestern, it's just like, it's like the like doctrinal, doctrinal description, tactical terms and, dra- and graphics to basically say, oh, <laughs> didn't look so good. Well, that doesn't, did, it didn't look so good. Oh, you yeah. might open this fucking pit up. <laughs> fuck's sake oh my god yeah well. more mps are being dispatched to the scene armed with pistols and when they arrived they immediately pulled their guns on the aussies who are facing them down armed with batons knives and more than a few guns it was almost certainly going to turn into a fucking bloodbath when one aussie officer emerged from the crowd walked between the two sides and convinced the mp officer to simply load his men into a truck and drive them away before shit got really stupid. And it worked. It's that fucking, like, the Kylie Jenner Pepsi commercial, but it worked. <laughs> yeah, it's like, there's a part of me that, 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 where you're thinking, like, well, guys do realize that you are, you technically, like, if you gave them a legal order that they had to, like, take out their toothbrushes and clean their dicks with it, they had to do it right now. Right? Like, you are kind of in charge of them. Like, it, people are reacting, like, oh, what can we do? Force of nature. It's a hurricane. It's just like, no, it's troops being stupid. Like you, you kind of, you kind of have some powers. Yeah, you get the nineteen-year-old with the responsibility to tell the other nineteen-year-olds to cut the shit and go home, and generally they'll do it. Yeah, that nineteen-year-old has exactly one more squiggly line on his shirt, which means he can tell that other nineteen-year-old that he has to do push-ups until he dies. So, like, use that power. Yeah, and the one Australian officer is like, "Have you guys considered just going home?" Have you guys considered the military rank structure? <laughs> and the American officer's just like, hey, I guess we could do that. That sounds a lot better than, you know, committing a second larger mass shooting in the streets of Brisbane. Yeah, it's like, hey, I, I, I know you guys are all like, I'm, me too. I'm a huge fan of, 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 of fucking like heroic barbarian combat. But we have invented the regimental system about 400 years ago. Have you guys thought of that? We got all this ice cream and women back on base. Let's just go there. Yeah, this tur- turkey's getting cold, man. Go eat it. Eat, eat some turkey. After this incident, the situation slowly burned out. Also, military commanders actually tried to get their men under control for the first time. Then came the aftermath. Private Grant was court-martialed for manslaughter, you know, for committing a mass shooting in the middle of a riot. He was immediately found not guilty in the grounds of self-defense, um, which admittedly kind of sounds right. <laughs> really argue with that, although it was incredibly stupid to put him in that situation. Right. But as you said, when you send the 19-year-old MP and he's outnumbered and 300 and to one. Like, <laughs> and they're like, like, yeah, exactly. Like guys who basically have the 4X beer logo tattooed on their face show up and they're like, that guy's got a gun. So now we need to kill him. Like you kind of can't act surprised. So I feel like this is like, I'm sure this went this over. This is like the military I, law version of like, let's just call it even. Yeah, 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 yeah. But also, it's like you can't really be surprised. I am, and I, I imagine this didn't go over very well with Australia. Honestly, it, at this point, it was all kind of burnt out. Like five Australians yeah. are found; gu- <laughs> they were so blacked out they didn't remember. <laughs> like five Australians are found guilty of assault, uh, but the the longest sentence any of them served was six months in a military prison. So it was all just kind of a wash after that. And this wouldn't be the only time something like this happened between Americans and Australians or even in the region, as a similar riot would blow up between Americans and Kiwis in New Zealand in 1943. Hell, this kind of thing happened in the U.S. between American soldiers and American civilians. In case anyone wonders why you know a term like zoot suit riot, that would be why. 
And we will cover that one day. I just remember in the background, people talking about the book that the Joaquin Phoenix movie, Buffalo Soldiers, was based on. The author said when he was researching this novel, he just was shocked to learn that like in West Germany in the 80s, there was like between 20 and 30 murders each year that were committed, American troops murdering other American yeah. troops. Like, it's just, yeah, this happens. I mean, I, I do think there's a certain thing that comes with like, if you train thousands of people how to kill people and then lock them all in a room together, that is the inevitable outcome. Which, I mean, there's an easy solution to this problem, but, you know, whatever. Now, there, there was no real aftermath or a come-to-Jesus moment in the wake of the Battle of Brisbane. As one American soldier put it, quote, After that, it just sort of settled down, and you go into a pub, and an Aussie would come up to you and slap you on the back and say, Wasn't that a good ruckus we had the other night? Here, have <laughs> hey, a beer oh, on fa- me. Fa- yeah, fat fox, mate. Like, basically it. Yeah, and that's, that's the Battle of Brisbane. Um, uh, kind of sort of long simmering hatred between two people that ended in a, in a police murder. <laughs> yeah. And now you can recreate it by going to Australia and disrespecting me goreng noodles, especially the Indomie me goreng noodle packets. Maybe you can get 300 Australians to beat the shit out of you for it. I'll take your word for it. I don't Go know around. what any of that means. Oh yeah. Me goreng, it's, it's Indonesian food, but like obviously Indonesia is much closer to Australia than other East Asian countries. And so like in the way that we have like Marichan ramen in America, like Indomie brand me goreng, uh, okay. which is just their, like it's it, instant noodles basically. Gotcha. Uh, but it's, it's a thing. And I know this both from being a weeb for Australia, being an Australia bunch, and then also being a member of a Facebook group called blokes and their me goreng, where people post photos of their me goreng and people either say rang on or rang off if it's good or bad. I fucking love Australia, man. I it's because of Australia, Australia that I know what hooning is. Oh, hooning. Yeah, hooning is a whole different. Like, we didn't make a single hooning joke this whole time. I didn't I mean. know how to shoehorn it in. The, the, well, the guys in the truck, they were just, they hooned too hard. They didn't use it for its, mil- its most casualty producing purpose. They just hooned it into That's a true. wall. They hooned too close to the sun. Yeah, because they, they're, like, they're like, they were actually burning rubber trying to get to Mount Glorious and find the pavement that's been designed to blow out your tires so they can blow out the tires <laughs> on that truck. Uh, that is the Battle of Brisbane. Nate, we do a thing on this show called Questions from the Legion. If you'd like to ask us a question from the Legion, you can donate to the show on Patreon, and you can ask us in Patreon DMs. You can ask us in the Discord. You can put it in a truck and hoon it directly into a wall, and we will answer it on air. I'm getting word from our podcast attorney, don't do that last part. Um, yeah. we, can't, we can't support hooning. <laughs> we can't actually support it. Because then we'd be banned in Queensland. They'd, they'd make the podcast assume corporeal form and they would crush it and leave it on the front lawn of the Queensland government. A thing they did with a hoon car, thus creating the best hooning trophy and hooning prize ever. You could make the government so mad they crush your car and leave it out in public. The point is to fuck up your car. Why wouldn't you do this? You've just incentivized the hoons. the king of all hoons. Hoon king. Um, today's question is... You guys are in your 30s. What's something that you learned growing up that you... Uh, what's something you learned while you're getting older that uh, you wish you would have known when you're younger? Uh, I could think about that one. Do you, do you have one off the top of your head already? Or um, do you want me to go? I'm going to go with something outside the obvious here because someone's probably assuming I'm going to say something about the military, but that was I've been out of the military for a very long time. Um, I'm going to go with moisturize your goddamn face. Otherwise, you're going to be 35 like me, and people are going to think, like, so what are you, like 40, 41? <laughs> yeah, I, sh- I should be better about that. Um, I, I have the, I, I've always looked young, so that's at least helped me, but like, I can definitely tell my, my skin, skincare regime is not, regimen, regime, whatever you want to call it, not doing very well. Um, I would say, I think that in my 30s, I have learned that there is a degree to which, you either get with the program and start looking at what it is about your life that makes you unhappy or about yourself that makes you unhappy and and assess what you can do to fix it, or at least to make yourself not feel bad, or you accept that you will just be miserable. And I think for me, a lot of people talk about kind of like having to give up notions of things. And it's weird because for me, like I gave up the notion of having a straight job and went and did weird stuff and it worked out for me. It doesn't necessarily work out for everyone. And there's certainly some people are not cut out for the kind of uncertainty of that life. But I would say the biggest thing is that if I look at stuff, because I, I was 29 when I got out of the army. So I've only, in my 30s, I've only been a civilian and I'm almost 40. 
I would say the biggest thing for me is that I, I'll give you a, a one concrete example because we we've gone on pretty long. So exercise was always a thing that I did because it was kind of taken care of for me in the sense that I was a high school athlete and particularly when I was a swimmer, I mean, we trained a lot. You know, I probably did, I think only maybe one or two days a week where we didn't have two a days and we always had uh, Saturday practice as well. So we'd have Monday morning, Monday night, Tuesday morning, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, Wednesday night. I think we had, sometimes we wouldn't have Friday morning. We'd always have, sometimes it was weights. Most of the time it was swimming. So I was always in the pool, in the weight room, at meets, even on Saturdays. And then I was in ROTC. So I always go to PT. And then I had friends from ROTC and like, we'd kind of set times with each other. We'd go to the gym also. So I did that. Then I was in the army and I had PT and I had the PT test and I had all the stuff. I got out of the army and like, I went through a phase where I was in pretty poor shape because like, I didn't really enjoy exercising. Every now and again, the spirit would strike me and I would, I would run. And I, I realized a little bit in New York that I liked cycle commuting, but it wasn't really tenable, especially once I had a job in Manhattan and I was still living in Brooklyn. It is for some people, but it just wasn't for me. And New York is insanely dangerous to ride your bike in. Uh, but what I discovered living here in the UK, and, and I think as something that's, that my wife really encouraged, because my wife is a, it, later in life became an exercise person and it's a huge thing in her life, um, is that just finding a thing that like you are, you can say yourself, I am going to do X thing and I am going to become a gym guy and I'm going to do all this stuff. But like, if it doesn't click with you, then exercise is just more work and a chore. And as soon as you fall out of a routine once, you're falling going to fall out of a hundred percent. I think Tom and I have talked about that, um, on our, I guess you could call it our gym affirmation corner of like, it doesn't matter if you have the best programming and the best gym, like not every, like, we we've never worked. None of us have ever worked out together, other than lifting merch boxes up and down stairs. But like, I enjoy going to a gym and lifting weights. It's something I really really enjoy. But that's not what you have to do in order to be in shape or be healthy. Being healthy is much more important. Like, it doesn't matter what you look like. Become comfortable how you look, which is harder. Um, I think as you get older, as I found for myself. But also something that is enjoyable because if you don't fucking enjoy it, you're not going to do it. Yeah, I like lifting weights, but the thing for me is it's hard to make myself do it. And particularly, I get really annoyed when gyms are like chaotic and crowded and dirty. And it's, I live in a huge city in Europe. It's hard to find a gym that's not one of those. Whereas for me, cycle commuting has been the thing. And I just make it a point that I try to do that all the time. And that is my exercise. And like, I also like running, but it's my goal when we move to Switzerland is it's much more conducive to just kind of those kinds of sports. And I'm actually going to try and to I'm becoming train Nate for bicycle pilled. I cycle everywhere now. Yeah, cycling. And it's great for my mental health. But the thing about it is, is my wife made the point. She's like, you could, you can beat yourself up that you're not, you know, doing triathlons right now. And you're not like fucking in the gym, lifting weights and all this stuff. It's like, or find a thing that works for you. And if you enjoy it, it won't feel like work in terms of making yourself do the exercise. And that has been the difference. I am in much better shape and much better health than I was before we moved to the UK. And some of that is because I don't drink anywhere near as much as I used to. Uh, but the other part of it is, um, is that I found a kind of exercise that's good for like physical and mental health that I enjoy. I like cycle commuting. I want to do it if it's feasible because I find that the level of focus required in the sense you have to be paying attention, but also you can kind of be in your own thoughts. It's great for me. It, it, it makes, it simplifies things. It clarifies things. Like I feel much better across the board when I do it. And so to me, that, that's like a lesson in miniature that like, the thing that works for you isn't necessarily going to look like the thing that works. Like I know you, Joe. I know you take every chance you can to go to the gym because you like lifting weights. I, I don't dislike lifting weights, but I don't like it enough that I make it a thing that I always do. Like like I before he was famous, like his show is huge. Hassan Piker and I hung out in London and like Hassan, everywhere he goes, because he lost weight when he was like in his early 20s, every day he lifts weights. Like in the gym in, in London, whatever, fucking he finds a place to lift weights because he, he sticks to his thing, but he enjoys it. Yeah, I mean... It, it, if you don't enjoy doing something for like an hour out of the day, you're just not going to do it. I mean, it's like, then it becomes a exactly. chore, which, you know, yeah. you don't want to do. And like my, my, <laughs> my cycle commute to and from the studio, if I ride in and ride out is about an hour of, of cycling. And that's, you know, it's good. I, I, it, it's been great for me. My wife loves organized exercise classes, like, like boot camps and like Peloton classes, things like that. I have done enough organized group exercise <laughs> to last a fucking lifetime. Likewise. And I'll go to the... I'll go to them with her if she wants me to be there for one, like a special ride for her or something, but it's not something I would do on my yeah, own. Same. You know what I mean? And so she's like, so that's, 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 that's one small one. The rest would get into like, <laughs> might get into like sort of, you know, uh, interpersonal relations, relationship territory. And that's so subjective to everyone's experience. But I would say for this, for like that exercise and stuff, admitting to myself that it wasn't going to look a certain way, but there was a thing I could do that I enjoyed has made a huge difference. hundred percent, dude. Like that, I think that's one of the, the problems that comes with modern fitness culture, and I can go on about this about fucking length, is that we're also pre-programmed 
to have this idea of what fitness is supposed to look like. And it probably looks like something like close to what I do. Um, and that's not a universal truth by any stretch of the imagination. Not everybody needs to, I don't need to do what I do. I do it because I enjoy it. And like it, you could cycle, which I do. And I, I've, I'm coming to really enjoy it, especially like today when we actually have good weather for once. Um, I do it every chance I get. Um, like, or maybe you just like playing fucking pickup basketball or fucking who honk ball. I don't know. <laughs> like whatever, whatever you, maybe you just like going for walks. Like, yeah. I mean, that's what my wife did when she couldn't run when she was pregnant. She loved doing like, she'd walk a 5k, yeah. you know, like, like every chance yeah, she could. And the nice part is, is generally speaking, walking, you're not going to get ripped off. Uh, trying to having to pay some inflated gym membership to go for a walk Ultra, yeah 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 like 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 tr- operator focused tactical walking yeah. um but that is a podcast nate you host uh, you host other ones i sure do i am the co-host of what a hell of a way to die a podcast about why you shouldn't join the military and also about being a dad and uh the the, the die part is about the military the the what a hell of a way to diaper i suppose <laughs> should be what, what a hell now. of a way to what dad, a dad. Yeah, exactly. And then also I produce and am the co-host of uh, Trash Future, a podcast about why tech is great and not problematic at all. And I am the producer of Kill James Bond, a very, very funny film podcast uh, that you should check out. So, And then also I am the uh, co-host of this show as well as executive producer, I suppose. Not really the tape cutter anymore because we got Tom <laughs> for that, but uh, I, am, uh, I am also part of this. So you know what? Um, it's wonderful to be here. It's been great speaking with you, Joe. Um, I feel like I don't want to steal your thunder and be like, until next time, don't do this. But we all know where it's going. In, in, until next time. Uh, God. Um, don't fuck spiders. Don't fuck spiders. And if you do, use protection. And by that, I mean anti-venom. <laughs>